This is a study that I've been working on for a little bit. Um, and I believe it's important to talk about. Of course, you see the title here. Uh, this is a this phrase right here is all throughout the Bible. Gird up your loins. Uh, many people believe that they know what it means, you know, but um, we're going to explain it a little bit tonight. And I only have one slide. Oh, you got there. It's the only slide we're going to have tonight. So. So I got two books tonight that I'm going to reference. I don't know if you've ever heard of this guy, Donald Barnhouse, The Invisible War. Talks about Satan, um, explains him biblically, you know, goes through and talks about the war. And then, of course, The Christian in Complete Armor, Volume 1. Both of these books, Maria got me. So, thank you for that. <laughs> so, we're going to reference them. Of course, we're going to go through a lot of scripture. And what we're going to talk about. Is this right here the battle that rages? All right. For well, let me ask you this: Who is not under the realization that we, as Christian people, are in a war? All right. Now, most Christians will say, "Amen." Most Christians will say, "You're right. We are in a war." But a lot of people. Don't recognize it when it's happening, uh, especially younger Christians. And a lot of people don't know how to combat it when it does happen. All right? And that's what we're going to talk about a little bit tonight. When we talk about warfare, we have talked about how the Old Testament is a picture and shadow of things to come. And how the New Testament is the very image. Right? Right? If you look all throughout the Old Testament, warfare is, it, the Bible is full of warfare, is it not? Mm -hmm. With David, with, uh, there was peace during Solomon, but all the, the children of Israel and all the battles that they went through. I mean, almost every other page is a battle going on. There's, there's battles going on, right? So scripture is full of warfare, you know, and people talk about, well, God, you know, uh, a true God would not, you know, kill this many people or allow war or allow this to be war whatsoever or whatever the case may be. But if we remember that everything is a picture looking forward to the spiritual, we'll understand why a lot of this stuff happened. So I'm going to take a different angle here and I hope that you can catch what I'm saying. I hope the Lord uh, works in your heart and you can catch the things that I'm saying here. But I'm going to start right here first. And I'm going to say we're going to start with true faith into the falling away. All right? Into a falling away. Okay? In Ephesians 4, 5. Turn there real quick. We're going to go to probably every scripture up here. To make sure we get a good idea of this. Ephesians 4, 5. Start at 4 4. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith. We're going to stop right there. There is one faith, all right? 2 Thessalonians 2 3. Turn there. Remember the scripture is a puzzle. We've got to put it to together here. Thessalonians 2 3. Word of God says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there be a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed in the son of perdition. So there's one faith. There will be a falling away. We'll discuss that in a second. Now turn to 1 Timothy 4 1. First Timothy 4, 1 Timothy 4.1 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from what? The faith. 
that one faith, some shall depart from that one faith, right? So, there's one faith, there's going to be a falling away, and Timothy says that there's going to be a departure from the faith, from that one faith. Now, the falling away is a separate thing, we're going to see that here in a second. Falling away, the word falling away is apostasis in the Greek, all right, apostasis. This is what that word breaks down to. Apo means a separation. And stasis means a firm standing. A separation of the, a firm standing. All right? The falling away is in opposition to the faith. Here's why. The faith is the same exact word as falling away, except it's the other form. It's hypostasis, which means under a firm standing. Let me read something for you. Hypostasis is the quality of confidence which leads us to stand under or endure or undertake anything. That's what faith is. Faith is the substance, right? Hebrew says it's a substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. Right? That's the definition of faith. So the falling away is the lack of the substance. That's exactly what it means. All right? Now the falling away... Uh, when, if you read that in, in uh, 2 Thessalonians, it's not necessarily talking about believers there. Let's turn there real quick. 2 Thessalonians 2 3. This is going somewhere. Just stay with me. Look at verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they re receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth. So are those believers? No. The apostasis, the separation of the firm standing, or the opposition to the substance is not believers. They don't believe. They, they don't have faith. So you, what you're going to see is, and I want to make this clear too. I want to show you something interesting too. This word comes from the word staros, which is where you get the word cross. Jesus died on the staros. So it's interesting to think too that you could probably put that there and say, there's going to be a, a refusal, a separation from the cross. You know, separation from faith in the cross. Now, as far as the one faith, the people who, who say they have the faith, like in Second John, it says uh, that there will be people who profess Christ. And then there's going to be people who leave. They, they don't. Well, let's look at it. Let's look at Second John. Second John. Or first John, sorry. What chapter? Uh, uh, sorry, chapter 2. First John chapter 2, verse 18. Little children, it is the last time, and as you have heard, that Antichrist shall come. Even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us. Wait a minute. What do you mean they went out from us? They claimed to be of us. They claimed to be of Christ. But they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. You see? So, there's going to be many. The falling away showed that it's not believers. It's people who, it's people who are, they don't have faith at all. You're going to see just mass, a mass worldwide thing of people who are not uh, have, who don't have a firm standing 
The people who depart from the faith, John says they're antichrist. They say they have the faith. They profess Christ openly. And then one day they say Jesus Christ is not real. He's, he's not true. He's a myth. You know, all these things. And so there will be people who depart from the faith. Some, many, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, right? <clears throat> so that means that there are people who were of the faith, who said they were of the faith, but they are not of the faith because they departed from the faith. Yeah. So why will these people depart from the faith or fall away or get seduced to the, the evil spirits? Or in Galatians 3, it says, who hath bewitched you, O Galatians, right? That... that you so quickly left the gospel that was preached to you. Some witch or, you know, Judaizers or whoever it was came by and gave them a different story about who Jesus was and they went away. They were bewitched. How does that happen? And I said I was going to use my, one, of, one of my wife's, uh, I was going to uh, honor my wife with this statement here. She's not the military. Don your gear. All right, this is a, this is, if you've been in the military, anybody been in the military? One, I know one. All right, don your gear is a, I mean, it's a common statement when you go to combat. All right, and I'm going to give you a little account uh, of what happened in Iraq and then we go through all this a little bit. I don't talk about it, all that stuff a whole lot, but it pertains to this. So, the reason that many people are going to depart from the faith, many people are going to get seduced, Many people are going to get bewitched is because they don't, either they're ignorant of how to don their gear, their battle gear, their battle arraignment, or they're inexperienced. Now, follow me now. Turn to 2 Corinthians. Verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. So what do we war after? If you don't walk war in the flesh, what do you war after? What do you war after? The spirit. Right? I didn't write this down. Who could tell me what verse they can look it up real quick about the wiles of the devil? Anybody? Type that in right quick. Somebody. Wiles of the devil. Ephesians 6 11. Ephesians 6 11. Yep. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand the wild, stand against the wiles of the devil. So why do you put on the armor of God? Stand against the devil. To stand against the wiles of the devil. That's why you do it. Alright? Now the word wiles there is this word right here. Methodia. What does that sound like in English? Method. Method. Where did you find it? Yeah. Did you find it? So we don our gear, we don the armor of God to stand against the wiles of the devil, the methods of the devil, or the schemes of the devil. Right? The schemes. Now, is there a way to predict the schemes of the devil? Is there a way to know what he's going to do? I'd say. Well, let's, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I was going to say, yeah, uh, you can look at what he tends to do in the Bible. That's exactly what I was yeah. going to say, too. <laughs> you go to Scripture, there's so many different instances that show exactly what Satan's doing, right? Different people have different experiences. He's doing different things to different people. But ultimately, ultimately, his method is to undermine the Scripture, undermine the Word of God. He wants to, he wants to make you lose your faith in the Bible. So over and over, different times in history, you'll see... 
whether it's uh, the Middle Ages, whether, you know, the Reformation comes about, you know, all these things in the past where he would consistently bring doubt in the people's minds and it would turn into this big thing. And it's happening now, right, where, you know, people are talking about the histori his historicity of Jesus and he was only a right. man of, you know, liberal theology and all this kind of stuff. He's trying to undermine the Bible. Been doing it since day one. Mm -hmm. And he did it in the garden. Yeah. Did God say, right? Yeah. Yes. I was just going to say that. That was like his very first. That was the very first, very first thing, thing he said, he said was uh, to question God's word and say, yea, hath God said. Yes. And you can, have, you can see him say that all throughout the Bible. Right. right. So his main method is to make you doubt scripture. Doubt the word of God. Right. So this is the reason we have to don our gear or put on the armor of God. All right. Now, turn to 1 Peter 5. I want to say this before I read this scripture. I am 36 years old. 36 years old. I haven't been a Christian as long as probably most of you in this room. And I am not exhorting you. <laughs> Peter is saying this. I'm reading what Peter said. But the only reason I'm saying this is to target younger Christians. I just want to say that. All right. The only reason I am reading this is to show you a, a part of scripture that many may have not seen, but I'm targeting it toward younger Christians. So first, Peter, uh, first Peter five says this, the elders, which are among you, I exhort. So Peter this is the living. The Bible's living. Peter's talking to the elders of the church. Who, uh, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also partake of the glory that shall be revealed. This is what he says. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords of God's heritage, but being in samples or examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So in this context right here, this whole context, the reason I read this here is because Peter says that it's incumbent that the elders, that the elders, they teach, they counsel the younger. All right. Now, why is he saying that? In this context, it's because you have been on the battlefield for longer, right? An elder has had the armor of God on longer than a younger. So he knows how to don his gear. He knows what happens when the devil comes. Now, I want to say this too. Just because you're an older person does not make you a more mature Christian than maybe a younger person. That's right. I just want to say that. That's right. All right? Yeah. It, doesn't, it doesn't mean that. But because young, the younger people are supposed to honor the older people, I just want to let you know that I'm not, you know, putting anybody on levels here. All I'm saying is that the older Christians who are steeped in the doctrine of Christ and the word of God should be teaching the younger. There should be a connection. I think there's a loss of connection between the older generation and the newer generation. I think it's always happened. You know, um, it would it just. But. God works his ways to, to get the younger people to learn. So the elders have an experience that the younger people need to know. An experience on the battlefield, the spiritual battlefield. Charles Lawson. I talk about him often because I listen to him often. I was listening to, to a sermon of his. And he said this scripture right here. I want to read it for you. Let's turn there. Exodus 13. This sums it up right here. This, this scripture right here sums this up. Listen to this. Remember, we're looking into the spiritual now. This is spiritual. I'm going I'm to try to explain this. Look at verse 17 of chapter 13. 
And it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. Now here's what this means. Here's what this means. What does Egypt mean? In the spirit. The world. Okay, the world. But there's a, there's a more significant term. Bondage. Yeah. All right? Bond, sin. Bondage. Right? So God has redeemed his people out of bondage, the children of Israel. And now they're going the wilderness, right? What happens to a Christian? They are redeemed out of bondage and they get sent into the wilderness, which is the world. Mm -hmm. This is this is all right. And in the wilderness, the children of Israel had to depend on God. They had to trust in God for their food, their drink, everything. Did they not? For their lives, they had to depend on him. So when they're in the wilderness, God could have led, him, led them to the land of the Philistines. Now I want you to think about this. Right here. All throughout the Old Testament, who are the children of Israel fighting? Very often. The main the ones. Who? Very often it's the Philistines. Very often the Philistines. Yeah. The Philistines are a picture of the enemy that's going to come against you at all times. All right? They're going to constantly come after you and come after you and come after you. All right? God said, I'm not going to lead them into the land of the Philistines. And because if I do, these people might turn back when they see war and go back into Egypt. Mm -hmm. Go back to where they came from because they are about to go to battle. Now think about this spiritually. When a new Christian, a new born again Christian, do you not think, this tells you right here, that God gives a new Christian time. He gives him time to get prepared for battle. He's not going to lead him straight into the battle, into the enemy. Right? This is why you need elders. You need people, younger Christians need people to say, look, this is what God has showed me. This is how you put your breastplate of righteousness on. This is how you put your shield on. This is how you block this arrow. This is how you use the sword in this situation. You see? And that's exactly what God was doing here. He said, I'm not going to lead them that way. Because if I do, and they see war, they're going to get scared and turn around. That's what happens with a young Christian. They don't know what to expect. That's why the Bible says, do not... When talk, Paul's talking about bishops, do not get a novice. Don't get a novice. Why? Because he is going to be overwhelmed with pride. Yeah. He's going to get the big head. Right? The devil's going to use that situation and give him the big head. Because he's young. Older, older people who've been in it for a little while and they know what the devil's going to throw at them. They can handle it. With the, with the battle arm. Did everybody understand that? Pretty interesting there. The church, I just, I, I want to let you know, I fit this in right here today. I fit it in today and I just seen it today. Who's ever heard this name right here? Shema. Anybody? Anybody who knows Shema is? Let's turn to 2 Samuel. Man, what, what happened there? <laughs> My daughter got a hold of that. Make sure I got the scripture right here. It's like Samuel 23, please. Verse 11. Now this is um, this is interesting. Shema was the mighty man of David, one of the mighty men of David. Okay. He says, 
So, so in 2 Samuel here, 23, it's, it's explaining the mighty men of God, the different ones, all right? And in verse 11, it says, and after him, so after the last mighty man that I was talking about, which was uh, Eliezer, it says, uh, after him was Shema, the son of Agi, the Herorite, and the Philistines, listen to this, were gathered together in a troop, all right? So they had many troops, they were gathered together, where there was a piece of ground full of lentils. And the people fled from the Philistines. But he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines. And the Lord wrought a great victory. Let me illustrate that. There was a little patch of land right there. And the Philistines are got a troop and they're arrayed against them. And the children of Israel, the people of God, the young people of God, they left. And there was one man who said, and there was a little, one little patch right there of, of where the lentils were. And he stood there and said, I'm not moving. Come and get it. He stood on God's, he trusted God, and he stood in the face of all the troops of the Philistines. And by himself, he slew all the Philistines. He slew all the enemies. This... Is what the body of Christ needs. We need Shamas. We need that those kind of people who are battle tested, who know how to don their armor, who have been through these things before, to stand in the face of the enemy, stand firm, no matter what patch of land that you heard the it's a it's an English saying. You give the devil an inch, he'll take a mile. Right? You give him a little bit, he's going to take everything he can take. So you need the people to defend the inch. Yeah. You need Shamaz, who's going to, just one little patch of lentils. You're not taking any of this. You're not taking this little patch. Come and get it. And also, the warriors of Zebulon. You don't have to turn there. I'll turn there real quick for you. I just want you to read this. First question is 12. 33. Listen to this. Think about this in the context of a Christian, of the Christian church. Of Zebulun, such as went forth to battle, expert in war, with all the instruments of war, 50,000 which could keep rank. They were not of double, they were not of a double heart. This is what we need. We need warriors like the tribe of Zebulun, who are experts at war. If you understand, if we understand as Christians that we are in a war, then that means you need to learn how to war. We have to learn how to war. But our, like it says in 2 Corinthians there, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we were just out there. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. That, uh, verse 4, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. So in the Old Testament, you have one man who probably had a sword there and he defended a patch of land and he went through slaying. And then you have the judges, if you read the judges, well, I mean, David had one man there, I think it was Eliezer, who, or, uh, who killed 800 men by himself. I mean, how did he do that? With a weapon. There was a weapon involved. Um, so, but our weapons of warfare are not carnal, meaning they're not fleshly. We're not going to go out and, because somebody calls us a name or because somebody persecutes us, we're not going to go out and take weapons, carnal weapons that hurt them physically. What we're going to do is we're going to use spiritual weapons. Listen to what it says. 
For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Go through the Bible, type in strongholds, and see how many times you see strongholds. It's all over the place. Why? Because God was using the children of Israel to paint a picture of what was going to be like in the spirit of the children of Israel, God's people, pulling down strongholds one after another, one after another, one after another. You see? And that's exactly what's going on in the spirit. Look at verse 5. Casting down imaginations. Imaginations. When I looked up imaginations, these are the four words or the three words that I gave you. Philosophies. Colossians 2. Right? That they're going to be, there's going to be, look at, look at Colossians 2. Colossians 2. Verse 8. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. That's an imagination. See? A reasoning or a reckoning. There's a, people reason with you. You know, Paul reasoned with people. He tried to persuade people of Christ. But guess what? It's going to be the other way as well. They're going to try to reason with you and Tell you that Jesus Christ is not real and tell you, well, he was real, but he was only a prophet. You see? And they got to make you think. And what's it, what are they doing? They are getting you through philosophy and reasoning and different little schemes to question and doubt the word of God. That's the whole point. Is that not his weapon of choice? Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so. Going back to going back to Second Corinthians. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself except against the knowledge of God. Boy, there's a lot of that. Yes. A lot of high mindedness and a lot of people who think they know what's going on and think that they got it figured out. High things, you know, principalities and powers and things they know, just spiritual wickedness and dark places. These things are coming after you. Now, we're going to see here in a minute. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Every thought. Every thought. Because the thoughts of men are evil continually, yes. the Bible says. So you have to continually. I mean, this is a continuous, every day, every minute of the day, warring. If you're a Christian, the flesh hates you. Your, your body that, that, that you live in right here, it hates you. It wants to destroy you because you're spirit. Are you not? You're of the spirit. And so it's going to do everything it can to destroy you. It's going to, you know, um, it's going to make you want the things that you used to want. You know, it's going to do these kind of things. Paul will read that in a minute. But he was saying that my members live by a certain law and my mind lives by another law. I serve God with my mind and, my, you know, and I serve the law of sin with my flesh. There's two things going. There's, there's, I'm not going to say there's two people because you're one person. But once you're born again, Christ in you, right? Something happens. A war begins between the flesh and the spirit. And for those, um, you know, like I said at the beginning, many younger Christians can't see the war. You know, it's it's hard for them because they're inexperienced. They they're easily overtaken, you know. It's something that they're not, they don't want to do. You know, Jesus said, count the cost, you know, count the cost. And then he explains about a, a king going to battle with a certain amount of men, and he's going to sit down and think about it, whether he really, you know. These kind of things, a young Christian really doesn't ponder. You know, they, they run from them. They don't want a part of it, you know, and it affects them greatly. So... A sign of a mature Christian. Watch this. Now, I put older Christians here, but I'm not talking about old people, older people. I'm talking about people who've been in the faith for a little while, who've been to battle. Look at the next verse. This is what mature Christians are able to do that a younger Christian is not able to do. After casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity everything, uh, every thought to the obedience of Christ, they have a readiness to revenge all disobedience. You see that? They 
when the flesh comes against them, they crucify the flesh. You see that? When these philosophies and reasonings come about, they crush it. You see? They crush it. They don't let, they don't, you see this armor right here? Even under that armor, there's chain mail. You know what a chain mail is? You know, there's a, so that a sword couldn't penetrate it. The Bible talks about the fiery darts of Satan, right? And these are the fiery darts of Satan coming at you continuously, every single day, every single day. There can't be one opening or a fiery dart is going to get in there. Yeah. You see? So you have, to be, you have to be completely girded. You have to be, your mind has to be girded. That's what Peter said, gird up your mind. And you have to be ready to fight, ready to battle in the spirit. And you have to be ready to revenge everything that will come against your mind. Every thought, every spiritual, every evil spirit who will tell you that you are who you used to be. <laughs> you think you're a Christian. You think God loves you. I know what you are. I know exactly what you are. Let me go ahead and put a dirty thought in your mind. Right? You remember that? You remember that thing you used to do? You remember that drinking you used to do? You remember this and that? These are the kind of things that pops in your mind. And that's when it says you need to be, you need to hold captive every thought that comes because those things are coming. In the spirit, the devil's bringing these kind of things into your mind. And, you know, I think a lot of people struggle with the memory bank. Your memory bank doesn't go away, right? You remember stuff that you did yeah. 30 years ago. And what happens? You get beat down. It'll beat you to death. Satan will beat you to death with it, right? Because a lot of times you don't know how to defend it. You're just like, oh, man, I did do that. Did the Lord really forgive me for that? Even though I did ask for forgiveness, do I really trust in the Lord that he forgave me? Does Satan not use that? Do these things not pop into your mind? Yes. This is why this is the difference between a young and an older Christian, a mature Christian. They're able to take captive every thought. They're able to revenge back. You know what? The flesh is doing this to me. I'm going to crucify my flesh. I'm going to make sure that my flesh doesn't do this to me. And it's an everyday thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, this is why I have trouble. Me and the pastor talked about this a little bit. People who say I'm a Christian. Most people who say they're Christian. It's my belief that they're not Christian. And I don't really understand why they would associate themselves with being a Christian when they don't have any clue how hard it is to be a Christian. That's right. They have no idea. Now, I want, we're going to talk about this in a minute. But when I went to, when I went to boot camp, yeah, I was in the Marine Corps for 12 years. When I went to boot camp, the drill instructors, <laughs> you want to talk about you know, one of the worst experiences of my life <laughs> when I was going through it. But when I got done with it, it was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. And the drill instructors continually told us, they said, you think it's hard now? Wait till you get out of the fleet. This is the easy stuff. And you're, you're sitting there going, oh, man. You're telling me that for, I mean, we only got four hours of sleep. You know, you're telling me for, you know, 19, 18, 19 hours a day, you know, that we're just working and pounding and, and you know, wildness. I mean, it's crazy. It's, I got some PTSD from it, you know, this kind of thing. But it was rough. And they were saying that that's the easy part. Easy part is becoming a Marine. It's actually being a Marine that's hard. It's actually leading people that's hard. It's actually going to war and being a leader in war that's hard. This is the easy stuff. You know why it's easy? Because I tell you what to do. I tell you everything to do. I tell you when to eat. I tell you when to sleep. I tell you to go pick that up, this and that. I tell you that you, know, you need to mark your gear. I, I make sure that you're accountable. Yeah. But when you're out there, you do. Yes. You see? Yes. Absolutely. I mean, you have to, I believe wholeheartedly what Jesus says when he talks about counting the cost. I mean, you, when, you tell, when you tell people, and again, much of this stuff is for the mature Christian. 
you know, a newer Christian is not really going to, you know, they're going to go, what do you mean war? What do you mean I'm in battle? What do you mean there's a, every, we can't see it right now, right? But there is battle raging around us right now for the souls and minds of men in the whole world, right? I mean, that's, it's what's going on. We can't see it with our physical eyes, but we don't, we don't walk by sight, right? We walk by the spirit. And so we can understand uh, a person who has got into the scripture. They, they know what's going on inside a man, you know, uh, God's led them to see what's going on in the spirit realm. Younger Christians don't really understand this. So when you, when you are discipling them and you're letting them know that, look, after, when you're born again, um, you're a baby in Christ. You know, you have, you have to start studying the scripture. You have to start getting into the word. You have to start getting, you know, and then people have to start coming around them. Elders have to come around them and make sure that, that Satan is not penetrating them. You know, I, 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 I mean, in the Marine Corps, we used to do all kinds of team based things. You know, there was always a squad leader, you know, uh, these kind of things. But um, we always used to have people around and they would have a man in the middle when we would do like these wrestling matches and stuff, you know. And this was the king. There would be people like this. And this was the king. And we would do these wrestling matches like this. And you had to protect the king. I think that's the way it should be in the Christian church. I think when younger Christians are born again, this is what the elders should do. This is what mature Christians should do with them. They should surround them and say, you put them right here, we're going to protect them. You see? Yeah. Spiritually. Yeah. And how do you do that? You teach them the word of God. You let them know what Satan's going to do. You let them know what's going on inside of them when they have questions, when they are concerned about things. We take them to the scripture and show them what God says about them. But there have, I mean, all throughout Christian church, church history, you know, um, there's been a disconnect. I think there has. You know, younger generation comes along, older generation can't really relate to them, and it's hard to talk to them, you know, this kind of thing. I mean, I, I think. So, let's read these couple scriptures here. First Peter, I wrote Battle of the Mind. Battle of the Mind. And, and the, I mean, the Bible is chock full of these. I just wrote a couple down. First Peter 1 Peter 1.13. First Peter 1.13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is, that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Saying, gird up the loins of your mind. What does gird up the loins mean, by the way? Anybody? What's the statement mean? Yes. Uh, basically, uh, they would wear robes back in uh, the Old Testament, and they they would take the bottoms of the robes and they would tuck them into their belt okay. so that uh, they wouldn't get tripped up by anything that uh, they're wearing. Okay. That's right. So, you got anything to add to that, sir? Any sort of thought on that? <laughs> okay. Gird up your loins. Remember when uh, you remember when Job was uh, in his state, right? And he was feeling sorry for himself, you know. And he, I mean, his friends had come against him and things like that. He thought he had it figured out. What did God tell him? Stand up, gird up your loins, stand up and be a man, and listen to what I'm saying. Answer me, right? Gird up your loins is like what he told them in Passover. He says, put your sandals on, get ready to go. Mm -hmm. Get your clothes on, get ready, stand up, be watchful, let's go. Gird up your loins, put your clothes on, get ready, stand up, be alert. That's what it means. And he says right here, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober. What's he talking about being sober? Well, in the spiritual way, you want to be, well, people can be in, people are utterly Intoxicated. I don't even know if I spelled that right. If I didn't, I'm sorry. Intoxicated with the world, with worldly things. They are utterly drunk with the things of this world. Mm -hmm. And he says, be sober. Be sober. Let's look at the next one. Luke 12.
35. Let's look at verse 31. 1231. But rather seek ye, this is the Lord Jesus talking, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things should be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that you have, and give alms, provide yourselves bags which grow not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where, where no thief approacheth, nor uh, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let your loins be girded, and your lights burning. What do you mean by that? Want to have your lights burning. We remember when we did a study on the tabernacle or the priestly garments, we talked about the menorah. The menorah is a picture of the gospel light, right? What lights the gospel light? What is it that were the wicks were soaked in? Oil. Oil, which is a picture of what? The Holy Spirit. Your lights burn by the Holy Spirit. Gird up the loins, be filled with the Holy Spirit, and let your light shine bright to the world. Keep your light burning. Seven, Romans 7, 23. But I see another law in my members. Well, look at verse 22. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me out of, the, out of this body of death? I thank God through the, Lord Jesus, uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Is there not a war going on within you? I mean, man, it's every day. It's every single day. And it's every place that I look. I can't get away from it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I can't get away from it. I can't get away from my memory banks. I can't get away from, you know, something coming on television or, you know, even reading anything in a book or whatever. I can't get away from it. It's constant. Constant. Psalm 18. And this is where this is where we know we have victory over that. This is how we know we can have victory. Psalm 1839. Hmm. He says, for thou hast girded me with strength unto the battle. Who's thou? God. <laughs> for God has girded me with strength unto the battle. Yeah. Thou hast subdued unto me those that rose up against me. All the, strong, all the strongholds and all the imaginations and the philosophies and the reasonings and the doubt, the schemes and the methods and the wiles and all these things that the devil brings at you. God will gird you, right? And he girds you with the armor of God, the armor, right? That's what he girds you with. All you old timers here, we know the, the hymn by Martin Luther, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, right? I'm gonna read that for you. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing, our helper, he amid this, the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. Were not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Dost ask who that may be, Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord, so both his name from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, 
We will not fear, for God hath willed his, tr his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not fr from him or for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fail him. One little word shall fail him. You know, really? The word of God is that powerful. One little word of the word of God shall fail him. You see that? That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours through him uh, who with us sighteth. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. That's power right there. Power. Now listen to this. Quotes here. In the battle against the Word of God, which has been carried on even more vigorously since the invention of printing, printing uh, invention of printing made the book available to the millions, which is the Bible. Satan has manned every approach and used every artifice at his disposal. The Bible was burned and banned and scorned and ridiculed. It's been uh, given lip service by those who denied the power of its truth. It was in the name of science built on false hypotheses that the great attack on the Bible and the church came into the 19th century. And in our day, psychology and psychiatry claim to duplicate the efficacy of the blood of Christ to break the power of sin in the life. False cults by the score have sprung out uh, outside, sprung up outside the churches that are still creedily faithful. The heart of all, which is the denial of the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Within the bounds of the fellowship of those who confess the finality of the word, living and written, there are divisions and sects which are based primarily on something that man is to do for God rather than on that which the Lord God has done for his people through the work of his son Jesus Christ. Although within the churches, whose creeds are still impeccable, various delusions of error find their place. There are the accompaniment of organ music and suave preaching. Multitudes of baptized persons are in the snares of sacerdotalism, legalism, and all of the above, and have a form of godliness which, and, but which deny the power thereof. But in spite of all of Satan's strategies, his doom is sure. For it is written, the God of peace shall bruise Satan under the foot shortly. So, Satan, obviously, we, we just talked about that. Let me read you one more thing here. Well, let me go on to this first. There has to be a level of alertness. And I'm not going to go into all the scriptures that talk about alertness. The Lord Jesus talks about it over and over and over. Paul does too. That there has to be an alertness. In the Christian life, right? You have to gird your loins. You have to be ready. You have to be, you have to put on the armor of God. The devil's coming at a point that you ain't going to know. Take heed lest you fall. It's going to happen at a point where you may not know it's coming. Even though you're mature, he's coming after you in a different way. All right? Now, the reason I wrote that up there is because I want to give you a little story about being alert. And it's kind of, you know... Uh, it goes along with it. So I was in Alta Cata, 2004, uh, my first deployment to Iraq, and I was a E3. And when I got there, there was chaos going on. This is when they had uh, they had dug down this base where Saddam Hussein had buried all these planes, you know, hundreds of them, and hundreds of these bunkers. I mean, just huge things. And they had dug them down. And this is where we stayed. Every day, well, let's say when I first got there, they had built this big, we call it an iron dome, you know, steel building. And as soon as they got it built, what was happening was they called them hajis. They were, you know, the, the Iraqi people. Um, they would stand outside the base or they would drive on this highway, this main highway, uh, every day. And they would launch mortars out of the back of a vehicle into the base. Didn't matter. You know, they didn't care where it hit as long as it was hitting, you know. And so... 
But they sent a bomb in. It was a suction bomb. And as soon as they got this thing built, they seen, the, you know, of course, we're in the desert. So you can see far away, you know. And we try to build it up so people could see. But they could see these, this thing. And they sent a rocket in, a suction bomb. And it penetrated this thing and blew it out. And then, soon created a, a sinkhole. Just crushed it. Oh, wow. And that was the first thing I saw when I got there. <laughs> I was like, oh, my goodness. This is going to be fun, you know. And so we were getting... 25, 30 mortars a day in my camp. Just my little camp. There was all little camps around the base. 25 to, 30, 25 to 30 a day. And we were going out, I was part of an EOD team, which is we went out and uh, the army would call us up. They had found a bomb and I was security for an EOD team that would go out and blow up the bombs, right? So, and I was a mechanic as well, I was a diesel mechanic. Well, it was my first month there. I had went on an EOD run, security detail. We came back, we had found a bunch of cachet. Cachet is a load of bombs and you know all uh, ammunition. And we went to a bunker, and what we would do is we would bury a hole, or we would dig like this nine foot by nine foot hole, and we'd put all these bombs in there, put the dirt back on them, put C4 on it, and just boom, blow them up inside this bunker. And we would all stand off in a bunker to the side like this, you know, to the side and watch this thing boom, blow up. And it was just an exciting thing, you know. So after the day was over, um, I had a 24-hour a, a post. I stood the 24-hour post, and it was my time to go to sleep. So I went to sleep. And in my tent, you know, we hit, I was a Lance Corporal at the time, and, you know, Lance Corporal stayed with Lance Corporals. You know, in the Marine Corps, very, the ranks are very, you know, segmented. So I was a non-NCO, non and there was two other Marines who had been on post somewhere else, you know, working with the grunts or whatever the case may be. So they were there as well. We were all asleep, and I thought I was dreaming. I thought I was dreaming because what happened was I was laying there, and I felt a wave, all right? I didn't hear nothing. All I felt was a wave. That's what I heard. And I, it was like this. And when I woke up, when I came to, when I woke up, there is, his name is Abney, he was my friend. He's running around like a chicken with his head cut off, just running back and forth, running back and forth, you know. And apparently a bomb had went off close to us. And this guy over here is just stuck. He, he's in his bed, he's looking around like this, but this guy is running around. And so the only thing that I know to do is tell everybody to put their flak and cavalier on. You know, get your boots on, put your flak and cavalier on, get down. So we all get down. After I, we calm each other, you know, I calm them two down, we get down on the ground and we crawl out of the tent and we look and there's two tents. Now, this is the way it was set up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I was in this tent. These two tents had got blown away. Just completely blown away. And what happened is a Chinese rocket came in and just put a crater in the ground. But and it put sent shrapnel all through here. Yeah. Now, the only difference, is, the only problem with this was, this was a bomb that would go off 50 feet from the ground and it would blow, it would kill anything within a hundred meter radius. It was a dud. It was a dud. Jesus. What? Yeah. Oh, wow. It was a dud and it took these things out. If it would have hit there, it would have took everything out. <sighs> if it would have been a, it wouldn't have been a dud. So God was watching me there. But, this right here, when I start thinking about this lesson and being alert, I think about the man that I looked across to when that bomb hit, and I look at his reaction, right? He is freaking out. I mean, he is, he's lost it. His mind is elsewhere. He's discombobulated. He doesn't know what to do, even though he's been trained in this situation. When the situation happens... He doesn't know because he was not on the alert. He doesn't know what to do. This is the exact same thing that happens in the spirit. If you are not alert, if you are not, if you are not ready for what he's going to come at you with, if you are not prepared, and this is why we have, that's why I'm talking about the elders, to make sure that you're trained, disciple, make sure that people are trained to stay alert, to keep watch, because Discombobulation will come just like that. 
-hmm. when these things start coming and these people will depart from the faith because of that. I think people are going to depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits in a way sometimes innocently. They don't they can't they don't know what to do. Yeah. You know? They get bewitched and they, they go off. Can I ask you, Robbie, did anybody lose their life when I committed them two tents? Nobody lost their life. There was nobody in these two tents. Okay. But there was a female on she was asleep in this tent and she told the story that she was going to sleep. And when she, as soon as she went like this, and as soon as she laid her head down, the bomb, boom, and shrapnel went right over her face. Oh, wow. Yeah. Right over her face. So it was, uh, Iraq was an interesting place, to say the least. But, so what is the armor of God? We'll close it with this. What is the armor of God? Turn to Ephesians 6. Now, we read this all the time. Everybody's heard heard these verses. Ephesians 6. Let's start in verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood or man, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. This is why the Lord Jesus on the cross could say, Lord, forgive them for not, they know not what they do. Right? They don't understand what they're doing. You know? Because we wrestle against, not against flesh and blood, but against these, these powers. Therefore, or wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to, be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you should be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. We talked about that. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So we've heard those verses, right? We've heard all those verses, and you can probably break them down, you know, into truth and righteousness and salvation. But in reality, should we not, and does the Bible not say that you are to put on Christ, put on Jesus Christ? I can go through, and I'm going to do that right here. I can go through and point out, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. Go to a scripture that tells you what's truth. I am the truth. Jesus is the truth, right? So you gird yourself about with Jesus, right? Then you go to the next one. Having the breast, breastplate, breastplate of righteousness. Philippians 3, 9 says the righteousness of God. Jesus Christ mm -hmm. is the righteousness of God. And we will be the righteousness of God through him, right? Having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Who's bringing the gospel of peace? The Lord Jesus Christ. Luke 4, verse 12. You don't have to turn there. I'll turn there real quick. Luke 4, verse 12. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering the sight of the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised. Gospel of peace. Right? Above all, taking the shield of faith. <clears throat> Galatians 3.22 says that at one time we were under a schoolmaster. Right? But when faith came in, the schoolmaster went away. Who's the faith? Who do we have faith in? Jesus Christ. And take the helmet of salvation. I want you to look at this verse. Look at Luke 27. I'm sorry. Luke, uh, Luke 1. Luke 1. Oh, 
Oh, it's uh, Luke. Sorry, Luke 2. Watch this. Luke 2, verse 27. This is when Mary and Joseph brought Jesus as a young child into the temple. And he's talking about Simeon. And it says, and he, Simeon, came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him after the custom of the law, Simeon, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, what? Lord, now letteth Lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word? For my eyes have seen what? Thy salvation. Thy salvation. Who's salvation? Salvation is a man. Righteousness is a man. Truth is a man. Resurrection is a man. The way is a man. The highway is a man. You see that? So, let's read the last one. Read the last one in Ephesians 6. And the sword, let's see, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Listen to this. Revelation 19, 13. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called what? The Word of God. Yeah. The armor of God is Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's right. <clears throat> it's Jesus Christ. You know. You can go through and separate all those things if you want to, but I just showed you every verse that shows you that all those things are in one man, Jesus Christ. Now listen to this. Paul's admonition to put on armor falls into two general parts. First, a direction telling us what to do, put on the whole armor of God. Second, why we should do it, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So to begin, every recruit in Christ's army should be properly fitted with armor. First question that comes to mind is, what is the armor? Right? We are told, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ in Romans 13, 14. Where Christ is presented as armor. The apostle does not exhort the saints simply to put on temperance in place of drunkenness or for adultery to put on chastity. Instead, he tells them to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, implying that until Christ is put on, the creature is unarmed. It is not the man decked out in morality or philosophical virtues who will, who will repel a full charge of the temptation sent from Satan's cannons. It is the man suited up in armor that is in Christ. Yes. I know what we have to go through every day. And Christ is my witness. Before I jump out of bed, that's the first thing I do every morning. Every single morning, not one morning goes by that I miss putting on the armor because I know what the day could bring. Right. Could bring. That's yeah. good. And everybody should follow that example. Right. Everybody. So. To end this study, there's a lot of stuff here, but it all points to one thing, or a couple things, well, a couple things. There is a battle going on. Young Christians don't understand the battle. Older Christians need to grab them and say, come over here and let me show you how to battle. We must show them, older Christians should show younger Christians how to put on the armor of God, how to put on Jesus Christ. And go to battle. And go to war. Are there any questions? You know, when I was at my other job at the mink farm, I was called a Bible thumper, a freak, uh, brainwashed, and, and I just told him, I said, and I thank God for showing me the uh, scriptures and, and helping me to remember them. And I said, you know, it says in Romans uh, 12, 2, be not formed in this world, but be transformed. The renewing of the mind would be the acceptance of the perfect will of God. You cannot change something that you don't know. All you know is this world. And if you don't know the other world, you can't form yourself. Right? <coughs> so you try to tell me I'm brainwashed. And I mean, and they went on and on. And I, then Philippians um, 2, 9, 10, 11 come to me. God is highly exalted him, give him the name above every name, but the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Things in heaven, things on earth, and things under the earth. Yes. Every challenge you confess, Jesus Christ, your glory to God the Father. 
I said, now you can take that to the bank, buddy, because I'm telling you, you don't need to know him, but your knee is going to bow to him. Yep, that's right. And God gave me so many, I mean, well, I was seeing the pastor when he was preaching, I, when you think about uh, uh, 1 John 4, 4, greater he is in me than he is in the world. Because I'm nobody. Without Christ, yep. I wouldn't be sitting here today. I know that. Absolutely. But I just I thank the Lord for that. We are what we are by the grace of God. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Now, think about this, too. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. Right? Yes. It's the Spirit of Christ is the comforter sent after the Lord Jesus was ascended. He sent the Holy Spirit. And we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So, I mean, us as believers, we have every, we have the, the overwhelming advantage in the spiritual battle. Why? Because you are filled with Christ yeah. and you are covered with Christ, yeah. the creator, right? But again, people don't know how to employ it. They don't know how to don, you know, they, they're either ignorant or inexperienced in, in battle. And this is why discipleship is important. And this is why instruction in putting on Christ is important. <coughs> Any questions, comments? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, to me, um, years ago, um, like you said, I mean, we battle this every day where there are all kinds of battles, but years ago there was something that was really a stronghold in my life and I knew that the only when my husband was preaching at that time is saying over and over again renewing your mind renewing your mind yes. renewing your mind and I thought okay I need to renew my mind changing this thinking and I started memorizing scripture and my son who was in uh, the, on the Bible quiz team and he was memorizing 10 verses a day which I couldn't begin to do mm. but I, I went to him and I said, son, how do you do this? And he told me, and he gave me the formula, you know, how to go about doing it, and it worked for me. But I took it easy, and I started memorizing. And every day I memorized something or review something, every single day. Yes. And I didn't worry about keeping the references and stuff like that, but I found out something, is that when I needed the references and when I needed scripture, Boom, there it was. Yeah, wow. yeah. And that that's that's what got me through. It was it was knowing the word of God and having it embedded in my mind. Yes. So that I could recognize when there was a lie coming along. That's awesome. Yeah. Right. Anybody else? Any comments? Concerns? You know when you were talking about, you know, elderly and stuff, I like uh, Pastor Rose. He was knowledgeable in, in life because he lived it and seen the sins that had happened and how to avoid them and everything. And if he would have, would have had the knowledge because young people today, young Christians especially, he never had the knowledge of, of the smartphones. And there's so much knowledge in them smartphones today that if you take them, and I mean, like I was telling you earlier, I mean, I started on one little, little verse, I thought it would just be cut and dry. And I mean, I went, I, my mind don't comprehend it because I'm not educated like I, I wish I could have been. But it, it gave me something that I just kept going and going. I mean, I was two hours on this thing because there's no end that would just keep going to the next and next and next. And, and it's funny, but it's not ha ha funny, but it, it's something that wants to feed you and won't let you go. Absolutely. Let me, before we close, I want to say something about that. Who knows what a scrying mirror is? Anybody heard of a scrying? You heard of scrying? Anybody else? Scrying was an old ancient technique that witches and, you know, these, um, what do you call it, mediums and things like this, you know, people, uh, enchanters and stuff, they used to get this liquid. They would make this like a liquid, black liquid, you know, and it'd be like a, be like a black glass, you know, and they would talk into it and they would try to summon demons out of it, all right? Who's ever seen Snow White, right? The mirror that she mirror, mirror on the wall, what pops in the mirror when she speaks to a demon, yeah. right? Some, some, something speaking back to her and she's requesting information. Who is the fairest of them all, right? And the demon comes and says, you are the fairest of them all, right? These kind of things. And if you know the, the word for demon, 
comes from the word deal, and it means to distribute fortunes. That's what a demon does. It gives you what you request. The, you know, when Satan says to Jesus, I will give you all the kingdoms. Why? Because it's in my power to give you them. You see, you hear about all these rock stars and movie stars selling their soul to the devil for riches because that's what he does. He distributes fortunes. But anyways, so um, this scribe, they, they call it scrying, to, to speak into the glass or speak into this liquid and summon demons. If you pull out your phone right now, what's the color of the screen? And what is it clear? Can you see your face? Can you see your face in it? You can? I can. Well, if you got it cut off and it's black. Look in it and see if you can see your face in it. Yes. I looked and I seen it scared me. Now I want you to think about something. The people who invented all this stuff know what they're doing. The Bible in Revelation, I believe it's 13, says that the nations are deceived by sorcery. They're deceived by sorcery. Now, think about this. I would like to do a study on this, and I'm just going to make this real short. You are actually commanding that mirror by your finger. Can these technologies be used for a good purpose? God can use anything for his purposes. But let me tell you what. People think that aliens, and I'll get way off here, but people think that aliens and demons are like these things from outer space or their ghosts or whatever the case may be. But I want you to think about this. The word spirit means breath. It means air, right? You command, let's just say pornography. You use your finger to command pornography. And it comes on the screen. And what does the Bible say? That everything that enters into your eye and into your ear goes into your heart. Mm -hmm. Do you not think that there's evil spirits coming out of this device into the physical world? I'm sure. That's how they work. Yep. That's, it's, that's exactly how they work. Yep. Projecting out of this device into your ear and into your heart, or into your eyes, into your heart, and then your mouth speaketh what's in your heart. Yes. Or your actions speak what's in your heart. And evil spirits have now come out into this present world, physical world. Think about that. Yep. The phone, the cell phone is a can be used. God's used it. Absolutely he has. I use a cell phone to look yeah. up stuff. Can we say there's good and bad and everything? There is. Yeah. So, what do you need to do? Be alert. Yeah. Be a, alert. I yeah. yes. have a comment on discipleship. When I got saved in 86, um, the church had me teaching right away. It wasn't until six years later when I went to another church that I got under the leadership of an uh, older Sunday school teacher that I really became discipled in the church because I really had no idea what I was doing when I first started Sunday school teaching. No yeah. whatsoever. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I mean, discipleship is absolutely important. That's what he exhorted the elders to do, to make sure that the younger... And it also says that the younger need to respect the elders, right? They need to listen. You know, it's a two-way two -way thing. But we're in a battle. And so when we leave here, I, I, just, want, I just want us to understand that a little bit more, that uh, the battle is real. And, and there's a warring going on uh, for the souls of men, and, and Satan is coming after you. He's coming after you. Um, even though he knows that you belong to Christ, he's still going to get everything. He's still going to do everything he can do to discredit you oh, yeah. and turn people away from you, you know, and, and get uh, and beat down the name of Christ, you know. And it's like I said once before, you know, people will. It's like the camcorder thing, where your life, if somebody had a camera, right, walking behind you your whole life, or let's say for a month. And every time you did something wrong, they snapped a picture. They could put all that in a collage yeah. and show the world, look at this person, how horrible this person is. He says he's a Christian. But if they follow you around with a camcorder, those little wrongs are not as, you know, they can't put them in a collage because oh, sure. they're few and far between. Sure. You see, this is how Satan works. He wants to take those snapshots every now and then, you know, and, and make Jesus Christ look 
you know, look bad, and the word of God discredited them. So, gird up your loins. Any uh, comments, questions, concerns? It says in First Peter one sixteen, it is written, "Be ye holy, for I am holy." Yes. And I, I, you know, I think of these verses. You know, very. I guess we want, we only use maybe like a sixteenth of our mind, and and I don't even know if I use that much. There's a lot of space up here, and God give me. So with scripture, I don't know how it works, but I'm going to tell you what, I can set, I mean, scripture after scripture after scripture. And what I love about this, and, and I try to tell somebody, it don't matter if I knew the whole Bible, could quote every word and then live one piece of it, it would do me not one nickel was for good. But I just thank the Lord that you take a dummy like me and let me store all the stuff in my head. Ditto. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much again for allowing us to come here on this Wednesday night, extended study, and I thank you, Lord, for what you've given me and allowed me to see, and I just pray that you use your word to penetrate the hearts of the people and um, that you would convict us about this and help us understand that, that there is a battle raging. Um, Satan hates us. Our flesh hates us. The world hates us. You're the only one that loves us. And I just pray, Lord, that your people would come together, that we would help each other, that the elders would help the youngers, and the younger people would respect the elders and, and their wisdom that they've gained through you and, and, and your word. And I pray that you would fill us all with the Holy Spirit and, and gird us, Lord, with the armor, with yourself, that we may go out into the world and preach the gospel unashamed, um, and not afraid to uh, suffer persecution for it. Lord, as we leave here, I know that there are, there are spirits who understand what we're talking about here. Evil spirits know exactly what we're talking about here. And so I pray that you protect us this evening and throughout the week. I pray that you um, protect us from temptation. Um, and that you would get the honor and the glory for everything that we speak of here and the lives that we live. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, folks, uh, Robbie and I.